It's better farther on. All right, Judges 14. Judges 14. We had tremendous feedback and response from the message this morning on the birth of Samson. If you were not with us, this book of Judges has shown the national decline in the nation of Israel as they've drifted farther and farther from God. And the, the summary of the book is found in its last verse. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. What a recipe for disaster. Every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. No regard for the scripture, no regard for the God of Israel, just people doing their own thing. So we, we, we got to the place in Israel where the last judge, when, when the people are in bondage, oppressed by the Philistines, there's not one man living in the nation to whom God can turn to deliver the people. There's no, there's no Jephthah, there's no Gideon, there's no Ehud, there's no Barak, there's nobody left. And so God instructs Manoah and his wife as to how they will raise the son that will be born to them, and Samson will be able to do a little bit here and there to help, but not much, not much. The people never repent, they never ask God for deliverance. They have become, for all intents and purposes, Israel, Israeli on their birth certificate, Philistine in their day-to-day -day lives. There, there's no distinction between the people of God and the people of the world, and there's no concern among the people of God that there is no difference and no distinction. How like our times? How like our times? And what we saw from the passage this morning is that God asked Samson's parents to raise him under the Nazarite vow, which is a voluntary vow, but it wasn't voluntary for Samson. It was, it was placed upon his parents by God and he was not to partake of anything that, that came from the grape. And we saw this morning there's nothing sinful about grapes. In fact, they were the, the evidence of God's blessing in the land that he would give the children of Israel. But he asked Samson's parents to raise him in such a way that he would go farther for God than was required even of those who belong to God. And we challenged ourselves to be those people. The people who don't say, what do I have to do? But the people who say, what can I do? How far can I, not how far do I have to go for God, how far can I go for God? And then we saw that Nazarite vow, he's not put a razor to his head, which would make him a real outcast, would make him a real oddball. The Bible says very clear in both Testaments, God wants a man to look a certain way and a woman to look a certain way. And he doesn't want a woman to look like a man or a man to look like a woman. And he, he doesn't want anybody to be confused about who, who's a woman and who's a man. But the Lord wanted Samson to be raised so that he, he just didn't look like the rest of the people looked. And he would be ridiculed for that and an outcast for that. And the Lord really needs us. To raise up a group of people that aren't trying to look like Philistines and act like Philistines and conduct ourselves like Philistines, but to, to be so radically different from this world that we are ridiculed even by those who claim to be the people of God. Yeah. And then he was not to have any interaction with a dead body. And you, you would think that would not uh, ever be an issue, but in a culture, in a society where you don't call the, the ambulance and you don't call the funeral home and you don't pay somebody to take care of the, of the corpse and so forth, there's a, there's a lot to do involving death just in the normal order of family life. And, and if, you, if you think uh, there's, not a, there's not a grocery store, there's not a Walmart, so it's expensive, it's inconvenient to have someone do your hunting for you, to have someone raise your livestock for you, to have someone uh, butcher your animals for you. What, what God asked Samson's parents to do is make your lives very, very inconvenient so that you can raise a son who is not 
in any way part of or influenced by the Philistine culture and the Philistine way of life so that, as the Bible said in, in chapter 13, verse 20, uh, uh, 25, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Maybe, just maybe, here and there, now and then, this man can accomplish something for God. Now in chapter 14, he's been born, he's learned to walk, he's entering manhood. When we read the Bible, we read as Americans, we think he's ready to take a wife, he's probably 20, 21, 24. That's because we got all this school stuff. Not for it, I'm not against it, but in, in ancient cultures and in agricultural societies and hunting societies, he might be 15, 16 years old. Whatever the case might be, he has come, at least in his own mind, to years. Chapter 14, verse 1, And Samson went down to Timnath, and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother, and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines, now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. All right, Father, please help us tonight to believe the Bible enough, to learn its lessons, and Lord, may we have sense enough to trust you and obey you, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name, and amen. Exodus 34, 16, Exodus 34, 16. Let's start at verse 12. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break, down their, uh, break their images, and cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, capital J, you can point that out to your watchtower friends, is a jealous god. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods, thou shalt make thee no molten gods. That's pretty clear. That's pretty good. They got a different God than you have. Don't marry their daughters. Don't enter into lifelong covenant relations with someone who doesn't worship the same God that you do. That's, that's pretty clear in the Bible. All right, look in um, Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And verse number 3 is where we need to be. We might start a little bit sooner once we get there. Deuteronomy 7. Verse number one, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and that's where the children of Israel are in the book of Judges, and hast cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For, for, well, I just think, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will anger the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. Thus she, but thus shall deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. Now, 
here's the problem I run into, and here's the problem you run into. We read something that clearly stated, and then we give our reasons why we know better than God. We read something that plain and then say, but, but you don't understand. I have a special exemption because I'm me. If God says, this is a bad idea, and here's why it's a bad idea, why would I try to convince God it's a good idea? What, what makes us do that? But we do. So somebody comes along and says, well, those are Canaanites. They're not, they're not Philistines. All right, Joshua chapter 13. Joshua 13. And verse number one. Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth all the borders of the Philistines, and all Geshuri, from Sior, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanites, five lords of the Philistines. See that? So the Philistines are accounted by God as part of the Canaanite territory and part of the Canaanite peoples. They came, the Philistines originally came up from the region round about Israel, uh, around about Egypt, I'm sorry, just like Israel came up from the region round about uh, Egypt. They both came from Egypt across into this land that, that is called Palestine or Philistia which God chose to be the Holy Land to give the children of Israel. So they both came up, children of Israel came up with the one true God whose name is Jealous, and the Philistines came up with a God named Dagon. Two different gods, two different systems of worship. And the Lord says, don't marry Canaanites. Philistines are Canaanites. So let's go back to Judges 14. And we, we really gave a lot of instruction to parents and grandparents and prospective parents this morning. And if, if you didn't get the message, please, please listen. It, it really will be a, a great help to you. But this, this one tonight, the lesson of parents, it's, it's really easy. Watch this. Verse 1, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Phil daughters Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. And his father said, no. And his mother said, no. Let's practice. Ready? All together now. All the dads, ready? No. All the mothers, ready? No. That's a great word to learn. It's a great word to learn. And, and many parents know that word when they have a two-year-old, and they know that word when they have a five-year-old, and they know that word when they have an 11-year-old, but when their child gets to be 15, 16, 17, they forget how to say no. Mom, Dad, I saw this woman. Where? She's really pretty. Where? You should see her. She's gorgeous. Where? I really like her. Where? I want to marry her. Where? She's a Philistine. No! Come on, they've raised this kid for at least a decade and a half so that he could do something great for God. And now they're going to risk throwing that all away to cave in to the lust of his eyes. I don't doubt, I don't doubt that there's, if you're an Israelite, there's probably a lot of pretty girls outside of Israel. If you're a young man who's a Christian, I don't doubt there's a lot of pretty girls who aren't Christians. Samson's dad said, there isn't one pretty Christian girl anywhere? I mean, nowadays she doesn't even have to be pretty. She can put a fake picture and you can just text. You can... You can fall in love with who she wants you to think she is. You don't even have to ever meet. You can, you can have an internet romance. And... But his dad just, you said, well, hey, why didn't you just say no? Well, why don't a lot of parents of teenagers say no? 
Maybe they didn't want the conflict. Maybe they didn't want the strife. Maybe they, they didn't want to disappoint their precious little Sammy. Said, so, come on, Samson, that's not a good idea. You don't reason with a young man like that. He's living under your roof. You don't bargain with him. You don't discuss things with him. You say, no, you're not going to marry her. Why? Because, or better that this time, because God says so. Now, here's what you're going to tell me. Here's what you're going to tell me, because you haven't read the rest of the chapter. You've just read through verse 4. But his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Here's what I don't want for my son, my daughter, your son, your daughter, your grandchildren. Here's what I don't want. I don't want you to get in a situation where God can make something good out of it anyway. The fact that God could make something good out of it anyway after Samson has married a girl in direct disobedience to the Word of God, that's not what we're aiming for. Why are we shooting for book of Judges outcomes when we want Ephesians 5 outcomes? You don't want to say, young lady, you don't want to say, I'm 16, 17, 18, I've kept myself from the world, I've kept myself for the Lord, but now I'm going to marry a guy and hope God will make something good out of it. Come on, aim higher than that. Please. Young man, she's so pretty. She's so beautiful. I may never have a girl this pretty again. If she's that pretty, she's probably going to say no anyway. So don't, don't, get, <laughs> don't get in over your head. But honestly, pretty with Dagon? Pretty with a false god? Pretty with an idol? Pretty and you're going to have to give up Jesus? Pretty and you're going to have to get out of a Bible-believing church so she can go to one of those places where the, you know, the Philistines are happy? You don't want something that God can work something out of it. You want the best you can have from God and the best you can have from God is not to walk over Exodus 34 and not to walk over Deuteronomy 7 and not to walk over Joshua 13 and then say, but God, please, please God, save her. Please God, save him. Please God, make something out of our lives. Why would you sign up for that? Well, yeah, it's all Old Testament stuff. I, I, I'm pretty sure you can quote the New Testament with me. Be not unequally yoked together with what? Unbelievers. That's pretty broad. The Lord will allow you to marry a different kind of Baptist. The Lord will allow you to marry an assembly of God. The Lord will allow you to marry a church of God. The Lord will allow you to marry a Pentecostal. You might, you, you understand? That's pretty, that's pretty broad. Believer. I want a believer to marry a believer. And Samson's dad said, you couldn't find one woman out of all our people? You had to go get a Philistine? You couldn't find somebody that was saved? That's a pretty, that's a pretty low requirement. I'm not downplaying salvation, but... I mean, if you crossed everything else off your list, you had this big long list and, you know... 18 went by and you cross that off and 19 went by and you cross that off and if you get down to saved, don't cross that one off. I mean, that's really, he's, not, he's really not asking a lot. Unequally yoked with unbelievers. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Right? Believer, unbeliever. Surely you could do that much for God. You don't want to get married and then put your husband on the prayer list for salvation. You don't want to get married and then put your wife on the prayer list for salvation. Now, if you're unsaved and you get married and, and then you get saved, okay, praise the Lord. That's great. But don't jump into that fire and say, well, God, you, Samson, did something with Samson. Have you read Samson's life? 
That's not the goal. Five times in this chapter, someone goes down. Verse 1, and Samson went down. Verse 5, then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath. You know what they did? Instead of demanding that their son come up higher, they went down with him. You would not want to look at the photo albums down through the memory lane in the history of our church. You'd say, where'd those young people go? Where'd those young people go? Where'd those young people go? They wanted to go down, and mom and dad decided to go down with them instead of saying, we're going to stay up here. Well, I don't like that preaching. I don't like those rules. I don't like that they don't do this. I don't like that they don't do that. And mom said, okay, we'll go to Timnath. Dad said, okay, okay, we'll go, we'll go join up with the Philistines. Now, if your kids are seven, eight, and nine, you're, you're, you're back in this 100%. You're all in. You loved it this morning. I, great, I got great feedback this morning from everybody who has, has little children. I didn't get a lot from the teenagers. I'm not, I'm not finding fault with our teenagers. I'm, I'm just saying, you get 16, 17, you might have some different ideas about a Nazarite vow than your parents have. You might have some different ideas about Bible preaching than your parents have. And, and I'm going to urge your parents to not, to not make it easy for you to go down to Timnath. Amen. To not make it easy for you to saddle up with the Philistines. Sam's dad should have said no. Samson said, I want her anyway. He said, well, then you're on your own, boy. I'm not going down there. But he didn't. Uh, Samson went down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. So the, the three things you're not supposed to do is have anything to do with the vine. And you found a girlfriend in a vineyard. What are you doing in a vineyard, Samson? What are you doing near a grapevine, Samson? I didn't eat any of it. I didn't drink any of it. Why are you there? Why do so many of our Christians, and especially our young Christians, want to see how close to the cliff they can stand without falling off? See how close to the fire of hell they can get without getting singed by it. What are you doing in a vineyard, Samson? See what happens? You start moving toward the gal that you saw with your eyes. He don't know anything about her. He never even talked to her. He just saw her. And now that his eyes are on that girl, instead of on God, instead of on the calling of God, instead of on what he's been raised to do, he looks around, he's right in the middle of a vineyard. And he's certainly not the last young man got his eyes on the wrong girl, the last young woman got her eyes on the wrong man who found themselves in a place that didn't belong. And their answer was, well, I'm not doing what they're doing. Why are you there? Why are you there? Samson, if you're not supposed to have anything comes off the vine... Wouldn't you be safer on a cattle ranch than in a vineyard? Wouldn't you, been, wouldn't you be safer with a bunch of shepherds than with a bunch of uh, vine dressers? Come on, Samson. What are you doing? Well, and the minute a guy that's not supposed to have anything to do with grapes wanders into the vineyard, behold, a young lion roared against him. So well, he's, he's going to win the fight. I don't want to fight with a lion. Win or lose. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Boy, I wrestled with the devil and I won. I would rather live my entire life and never have to give that testimony. I don't want to wrestle with the devil. I don't want to fight with the devil. I don't want to encounter the devil. I mean, it's, it's great, God, you know, Samson, God, well, let's read it. 
Uh, verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. I don't think I could even rent a kid. <laughs> I mean, we're going to learn about Samson's strength later on, but so, yeah, you know the way he tore that kid in two? Well, he tore that lion the same way. Well, either one's pretty impressive to me. <laughs> Good thing Samson didn't live nowadays. You kill a bunch of Philistines, get away with it, but you kill an animal, he'd probably done five to six years for that. That's, Especially a cute, a cute, he killed a cute little kid with his bare hands. Now watch. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done. Here's what, here's what we want for all, all of you young people, and here's what God wants for all of his children. I don't want you to win fights that you can't testify about. Here, here's what we don't want. We don't want you to, to see a girl, meet a girl on your phone, and sneak out and go someplace you shouldn't be, and run into the devil, and escape by the skin of your teeth, and then go home and hope your parents don't ask where you were and what happened because you don't want to tell them. Amen. Samson, where you been? Nowhere. Why did he tell him where he's been? Because he's not supposed to be in a vineyard. Samson, what have you been doing? Well, I, I ran into a lion down there and I got in this big scrape with a lion. What are you doing in a place where you're going to run into a lion? I don't want you to get with the wrong crowd and almost get drunk and then run away when you realize you've, you've, you're drinking and you shouldn't be drinking and sneak back in the house and get away with it. We don't want you doing anything you don't want to tell mom about and dad about when you get home that night. We don't want you going anywhere that you have to stop talking about when the pastor walks up in the churchyard. So, well, it's a, it's a big deal. Samson, Samson defeated that lion. Apparently it wasn't a big deal. Apparently it wasn't a great thing. He didn't even want to tell his parents. Why not? If you're doing something you don't want your Christian daddy to know about, if you're doing something you don't want your Christian mother to know about, you're doing something you don't want your Sunday school teacher to know about, you're doing something you don't want the pastor to know about, you shouldn't be doing it. That's pretty good preaching on a Sunday night. Verse 7, and he went down. There it is again. He went down. And talked with a woman. Now he's having communion with her. Now he's having fellowship with her. Went down and talked to the woman. And she pleased Samson well. Now it's not just the lust of the eyes. Now he's got his heart tangled up. And after a time he returned to take her. And he turned aside to see. Boy, Samson, I got a mind to take off my belt and wear you out. He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. What's the vow? Don't come near any dead body. There's a dead body over there. Let me go over there. Samson, st strike one, she's a Philistine. Samson, strike two, you're in the vineyard. Samson, strike three, that's a dead body. What are you doing messing with a dead body? You've been taught from the day you were born. You got this vow upon your son, God wants to use you. God wants to deliver the nation through you. Come on, boy, stay away from that dead body. You know, all most people know about Samson is that he told Delilah about his hair and she cut off his hair and he ended up blinded and a slave. It's a shame that's all you know about Samson. Because if Samson 
had overcome the lust of his eyes and not gone down after that Philistine woman, if Samson overcome his disobedience and not messed around that vineyard, if Samson had believed the vow that God placed upon him from birth and stayed away from that dead body, he might have learned to be strong and stand in the, in the Lord and stand for the things of God instead of weak and given in to every lust and temptation of his flesh. He's the strongest man physically the world's ever known. Known. He's known for his physical strength, and the guy is a weakling. Every time he wants to do something, he can't say no to his flesh. Some of you are geniuses, and some of you are musical talents, and some of you can play on instruments, and some of you can memorize the Bible just as easy, and, and some of you got great personalities, but if you don't learn to say no to the lust of your flesh, you will wreck your life with all that talent and all that ability. Samson got to, he's got strong, he's strong enough to tear a lion in two, he's not strong enough to stay away from its carcass. He's strong enough to whip a thousand Philistines. He's not strong enough to control his flesh. I think that's important. After a time, he returned to take her. He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. We'll talk about that, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. That's a strange business, isn't it? And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. Now watch. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. See what he's got? Teenager, listen, listen to me. Listen, please, listen. Young lady, young man, listen to me. You know what, you know what he's got? He's got a secret life. He's got things going on in his life that are well concealed. He's got things going on in his life. Dad can't get into them. Mom can't get into them. They don't know what he's listening to. They don't know what he's looking at. They don't know who he's communicating with. They don't know what's going on in his heart. You know what? It's, not, it's going to break his daddy's heart. It's going to break his mama's heart. But it's going to ruin his life. Samson is going to end up blind, mocked, a slave, and dead. And everybody wants to preach the end of Samson's life. Nobody wants to tell how he destroyed his life. And he got there when he's a young man disobeying God secretly in ways his parents never found out about. Your dad ain't going to preach this at you because he doesn't know what you're doing. Your mom's not going to preach this to you because she trusts you. The fact that you can go to those websites, the fact that you have those friends, the fact that you made those contacts, you couldn't do that if your parents didn't trust you. They think you're who you are when they're looking at you. But if you're not that same person, God knows it and you know it and you, you need to pay attention to this. Now, let's, let's, say, let's say church just got out and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to be done here in a few minutes and, and one of you says, how about Dairy Queen? And somebody else says, I don't know, how about Subway where everything tastes the same? Uh, how, <laughs> no matter what they serve you, that smell of that bread gets in your nose and that's, that's, it's just that, anyway. And, and so I told some of the kids this morning, I said, I'll take, I'll take y'all, y'all hungry? Oh, yeah. I said, I'll take you Chick-fil-A, get you anything you want. <laughs> they were excited till one of them checked the calendar. Anyway, <laughs> and suppose, suppose I said, hey, I got an idea. There's a dead animal down the road. Let's go reach in there and get something to eat. Oh, sick. No, it's, it's like a beehive. It's, it's sweet. It's honey. No. You don't think the devil, 
You don't think the devil can put something in your path that's sweet and tasty and delicious, but surrounded by filthy, stinking, rotten death? just to see if you'll reach your hand in there and grab it and put it in your mouth. Yeah. Israel is a land flowing with milk and honey. It's not like he had to get honey out of a carcass. The land is flowing with milk and honey. It's, it's, when, when Saul was fighting and Jonathan was out there fighting, it's dropping out of the trees. I don't want orange blossom honey, alfalfa honey, sourwood honey, dead lion carcass honey. <laughs> They're not selling that at the flea market. Nobody's buying that. <laughs> and here you got this beautiful, I mean, it, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it, is, it is HD. It is liquid plasma. It, I mean, the screen is as big as the wall. It's the most beautiful video screen you've ever seen in your life. You want to reach in there and grab something sweet? Step back. Take a look at Hollywood. Hollywood. Step back, take a look at what those athletes and those ball players, what they live like. How they treat your flag and your president and your national anthem. Step back, take a look at their morals and their beliefs. You really want to reach your hand in there and get some of that? You really, you really want to spend an hour or two eating honey out of a carcass? Dead carcass of Hollywood? It's so sweet, it's so, yeah, it might be, but you get some sweet stuff from the Bible, you get some sweet stuff from the songbook, you get some sweet stuff from Christian friends, you get some sweet stuff from walking with God. It's not like the only honey in this world's in dead things. But the devil, he'll offer that to you. Verse number 10, so his father went down, just keeps showing up, doesn't it? Father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. <laughs> he, he took everybody down to Burger King. I mean, it's, a, it's a big deal. It came to pass when they saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If ye can certainly declare it me within seven days of the feast and find it out, then will I give you 30 sheets and 30 change of garments, which is a big deal in a day and time when you've got to haul your clothes down to the river and wash them on a rock. I mean, that's a, that's a month worth of clothes and all kinds of linen and the rest of it. But if you cannot declare it me, then shall you give me 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, Out of the eater came forth meat. And out of the strong came forth sweetness. Now that's not even a riddle. That's just, that's just impossible. You couldn't, you couldn't guess that in a hundred years. Some of you can't guess it right now and you just read it. <laughs> and they could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. <laughs> have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? So if we got to buy this guy a shirt, we're going to burn your house down. That seems kind of rational. You know, good, good balance there. And Samson's wife wept before him. <laughs> I mean, that's on page one of the, ma uh, the manual right there. Oh boy, this ice is real thin. I'm about to walk out on right here. <laughs> and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. I mean, it's right there in chapter one. It's <laughs> the marriage manual, chapter one. 
cry, say you hate me and you don't love me if you don't give me what I want. Now my wife would never do that and your wife would never do that, but there are many wives in, in, in the world who uh, would, would apply uh, such, uh, such intense pressure. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people, and it's not told at me. And he said unto her, Behold, I am not told at my father and my mother. And shall I tell it thee? Chapter 2 of the manual. And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. We're going to eat, we're going to laugh, we're going to drink, we're going to spend time with friends, then we're going to go back to the motel and fight. <laughs> Over the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him. All right, all right, all right. I'll tell you, will you just be happy? No. But <laughs> At least for tonight I get some sleep. That's... Nobody here knows anything about that. I'm just talking about what it was like in, in his day. And she told the riddle to the children of her people. Now, now young man... Let's go back to verse 1, when Samson saw that woman and said, wow! Never talked to her, didn't know her name, he just went straight home and said, Dad, I'm going to marry her, get her for me. And we, we went to the Bible and we said, Samson, Samson, she's got a different God and a different culture and it's going to be a problem for you. And Samson said, I don't care about any of that in the Bible. I don't want you to preach to me. She's beautiful. I want her. And he married her. But now he's finding out that he married a Philistine. And her loyalty is to the Philistines. And he says, but I didn't tell my own parents who I'm loyal to. And now you've got a situation. You got a man with one set of loyalties and a woman with another set of loyalties and everybody's going to get hurt. Everybody's going to get hurt. It's okay. Now, look, I, I, I'm just going to say this. It's, it's, it's what I, I, I'm, I'm officially licensed to do this. Don't, don't you try it, cause, but, but I, I can do this. It's okay for you to marry the beautiful Catholic girl who prays the rosary to the statue of Mary and who lights candles to carry her prayers to heaven because she's pretty and you're dating and she's pretty and you're married and she's pretty and you got a nice little apartment. But now she's pregnant and she wants that baby christened by a priest who's a pretty scary guy. And her parents want that baby christened by the priest, who's a pretty scary guy. And, and her whole side of the family wants that kid to get, cross my heart, hope to die, Catholic catechism training. Now you know what you got? You got a problem. And you got a problem that ain't going away until one of you gives up their religion and you already gave up yours to marry her. So now we got one more young man who could have done something for God, who sold out Jesus Christ for a pretty girl because he figured it'll all work out okay because the Bible isn't true anyway. And now he's been married three years and he's got two kids and he's going to a Catholic church that he hates and putting money in an offering plate to pay off sex offender lawsuits. And he can't do a thing about it because he disobeyed the Word of God. And if you're a Catholic, you shouldn't marry one of these kids in here. I'm just, I'm just saying, you got a different God, you got a different religion, you got a different set of beliefs, it's going to be a problem when you got children. It's going to be tough. Now, if you were married and then you got saved, we'll, we'll do the best we can, but, but you don't have to sign up for it. You're such a mean man. If you think I'm mean, it's because you haven't spent four decades of your life trying to help people dig out of the messes they make for themselves. Right. Trying to help you. Amen. 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 <clears throat> it's 
So anyway, where were we? Samson's wife crying, complaining, pressing him. He finally gave in. Okay, now here's, here's one of the great verses. This is one of those things, the first time you read it, you memorize it. You don't even have to repeat it several times. You just memorize it, and you know it the rest of your life. Verse 18, the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? You ready? And he said unto them, if ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. <laughs> now that's some great King James Bible right there. <laughs> I don't know what the modern versions say, but it could not possibly improve upon that. <laughs> if ye had not plowed with my heifer, moo moo. <laughs> He had not found out my riddle. Now, he could have just said, my wife told you, but this is so much more eloquent in the, <laughs> in the king's English. It's so Shakespearean and all. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down. That's not good. That's not good. And he went down to Ashkelon. It's one of the five key Philistine cities. And slew 30 men of them, and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend. So well, wait a minute, what about the sacred holy marriage vows? And what about in the sight of God till death do us part? Philistines don't believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Philistines don't live that way. You're, you're, you're quoting God stuff. They have a different God. Right. You're quoting Bible principles. They don't believe the Bible. You marry somebody who doesn't believe the Bible, and then one day you're going to be shocked that they don't live by the Bible, and you're going to try to get the preacher to show them what the Bible says. You married someone who doesn't care what the Bible says. I can't help you with that. Why well, they, they took his wife, they just took, she gave her to some other man, and she was his friend, and well, that's awful. People that don't know God do awful things. And they don't think it's awful because it's what Philistines do. Why would you marry someone who doesn't believe in God but believes they came from an evolutionary accident? Why would you marry somebody who doesn't believe there's a judgment and a heaven and a hell who just believes they're going to go in the grave when they die? Why would you marry somebody who all their friends think, well, try it. If it doesn't work out, you can get divorced and try somebody else. Don't sign up for that. God says don't marry their sons, don't marry their daughters, don't marry their sons, don't marry their daughters. God says stay out of the vineyard, stay out of the vineyard. If God says stay away from the carcass and dead things, stay away from them. Just trust God enough to see that according to the Bible, God didn't put these rules in place to hurt us. He didn't give us these commandments to make our lives difficult. He gave us this book so we could avoid Amen. making the mistakes that others have made. Good Thank God for it. Amen. Don't view the Bible as restricting you because God is against you. It's restricting you because He's for you. Is that fair? Long before Delilah took out that pair of scissors, a boy that was raised from birth and told, don't come near anything dead. He's reaching his hand in a carcass. Long before he put his head in Delilah's lap, and she made a blind slave out of him. He's chasing a girl in a vineyard. And God said, I don't want you to have anything to do with grapes. Young man, young lady, long before you're sitting in my office at 35, wondering what went wrong, 
you're going to be sitting in your car, 17 and 18 years old, taking your phone and your radio and your wheels and creating a secret life your father and mother know nothing about. And that is going to start you on a road that you don't want to be on. You just don't have sense enough to know you don't want to be on the road. Amen. Let people that believe the Bible help you when you're 16 so we don't have to try and help you when you're 36. Is that fair enough? Fair enough. Amen. All right. Father, thank you for caring enough to tell us the story of Samson. Thank you for giving us this uh, holy Bible so that we could be a holy people and avoid so many of the hurtful and tragic pitfalls and dangers of life. And we sure appreciate it, Father. And thank you for what you've done. Help us to, to believe you and trust you. Help our young people, Lord. They're, they're great kids. They're, they're great kids. I pray, God, you'd help them make right decisions and good decisions and, and, and not have a secret life, not have a hidden life. Have everything open up front, honest with their parents and, and with you. And Thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus, you are dismissed.